We're witnessing the greatest destruction of wealth in modern history, and this here is reflected clearly by the tech stock and bond market drawdown measured in the trillions. As you can see here, starting here in modern day, we work backwards to the COVID crash here, which happened in March 2020, but was quickly recovered from. Then we have, of course, most notably the great financial crisis and before that, the dot-com bubble. As you can see, each one progressively steeper than the last. In fact, if you want to chart a curve so far onto the points of this particular trend, Trend, you end up with something a little bit disturbing. But the point here is that what we're looking at is so beyond crypto. It's so macro. It's so general and financially systemic that it's important to realize what's going to happen once this entire move plays out. And of course, it's really important that people don't just unanimously blame crypto or single actors within the crypto space as it's so much bigger than that. And the crypto movement in general will continue. And in my opinion, is way more healthy than last last bear market, meaning that the next bull cycle should be even more healthy than this recent bull cycle. But let's dive in because I want to outline for you some really important facts and data points today that help you understand what's going on and plan for the future. If you're excited for this one, as always, we're bringing you as much content as we can through this bear market to help you prepare and understand what our approach to this crazy volatility is going to be. If that's exciting, smash that like button and let's dive in. New to investing, is this good or bad? As you can see, the S&P 500 heat map is uh, pretty much a wash with red. It's one of the most insane scenes I've seen. Again, just showing you once again, this is not a crypto issue, this is a macro issue. But let's take a look at the charts because we just had a very important FOMC meeting. And this one, as you can see, led to a short-term rally and then an immediate dump. What we've seen here is that effectively, the market seems to want to rally off of at least predicting accurately what the Fed will do. and then when the Fed does what the market has priced in or predicted, the thought is, okay, this is priced in now, and we can now rally. We can now move upward from here. But what we're seeing is there's absolutely no real confidence in these moves as they get sold into immediately. So what we're seeing right now is that any kind of high time frame rally, whether it's in stocks, traditional assets, crypto, anything, is probably going to have to be framed around a pivot from the Fed. Just to be clear, we're seeing the exact same reaction to this as the meeting in May with the 50 basis points hike. Initial rally, then we make new lows as the reality sunk in. The Fed will be raising rates aggressively and sending us into a recession buckle up. Now, if this isn't a recession already, I don't know what is, but I guess it's just a sort of formal designation for a collapse of this magnitude. At a certain point, though, things might break and the Fed might need to change their tune faster than they would have otherwise wanted to. But in crypto land, it's been especially bleak with the selling. And that's because it's not just Luna and UST. It's not just Celsius, but significant institutional lenders are blowing up. One of the most famous is Suzu's Three Arrows Capital that has just been margin called and has not been able to communicate with any of their lenders. Effectively, their silence is confirming that they are effectively bankrupt and cannot meet their margin calls, which means that they've started to get liquidated in mass. Let's go through what this means. So DGen trading here, HODL crypto. Crypto Knight uh, is some cartoon animal with a McDonald's hat on it. Um, and this is the kind of credible news sources we like to go for in crypto. Um, I'm joking, but at the same time, just because they're using an anon Twitter doesn't mean they can't provide useful information. We know that that's true. Uh, he also says he called the Celsius collapse. He links to a thread here. He also cites how on June 11th, uh, he explained why the staked ETH and ETH peg breaking should also cause you to worry. Anyway, let's dive in here. So first of all, the 3AC and its collapse is monumental. This is because they borrow from every single major lender. Think BlockFi, Genesis, Nexo, Celsius expect every lender to take hits on 3AC. The last public number for 3AC's assets was tagged as 18 billion. I strongly suggest that their real net asset value to be much lower than. There were rumors of them pledging their derivative stake, even though they had already disposed of it economically. But let's use that 18 billion. Assume that 9 billion of it is MTM mark to market VC portfolio. 9 billion of it is liquid, meaning that essentially they're quantifying that half of their portfolio is stuff they can't really sell yet. It's stuff that they own or and are entitled to. He says, assume that all of this was in BTC and the safest asset, yet I know they have an L1 that recently died terribly. Obviously, they were huge on Luna. And from November 21 till now, their liquid portfolio would have had a drawdown of close to 70%, even if they were just in Bitcoin. Their liquid portfolio would be worth about $2.7 billion at best. If you add shat coin exposure, realistically, their liquid portfolio would have drawn down to $1 billion or less from that $18 billion, which matches the reports on the street that they were unable to meet their margin calls. Not being able to meet margin call is the death knell for any hedge fund, crypto or TradFi. There are reports of them trying to use Starkware equity as collateral. Well, I guess you can call 
call it stuckware. 3AC is one of the biggest borrowers and clients for lenders globally. Their collapse would transfer the economic risk to their lenders. Their lenders would bear the PL difference between how much they owed versus how much they get in liquidating their collateral. These lenders are generally ill prepared. They operate 10 to $20 billion balance sheets with about 5% of equity buffer, which means that these defaults can cause significant equity erosion. Not all lenders are made equal. Celsius is the worst. It has gone under. Nexo, I don't know. BlockFi is pretty bad as well. After all, how do you lose money in a bull market? Genesis is probably the cleanest sheet in the room. Okay, so what this means is that lenders will need to protect themselves by withdrawing credit from the system. All lenders probably have about 50 billion estimated in loan creation, and he expects, this guy expects, 30 to 40 billion of credit to be destroyed, i.e. loans to be recalled and credit to be shrunk. Basic math, when credit leaves the system, there's less money overall. Less money overall for the same amount of coins, coin price down. So again, this is a sort of crypto macro thing, that when credit leaves the system, all coins suffer. We saw this on a very, very clear level, that that when the Fed reduced interest rates to pretty much near zero and turned on the money printer, what that effectively did was increase credit for everyone in the world. And what did we see was an explosion of risk assets. So as the Fed has turned the money printer off and raised interest rates, they're effectively making it harder and harder to borrow money. There's less credit in the world, which has tanked all assets. Now think of this as the crypto version of this, where you have all of these lenders getting blown up due to the erosion of UST and Luna that's then caused some contagion around the world and all of a sudden lenders are now not able to lend. There's less credit and that affects the amount of cash and capital flowing around for opportunities within crypto. Again, this is somewhat of a death spiral that was set off by the Fed, but then kicked into high gear by UST and Luna within crypto. So because this stuff can be pretty confusing, I'm just going to simplify this. Fed turned the money printer off. They also raised interest rates. Both of these things reduce the amount of credit out there in the world. That's why all of a sudden stocks and crypto started tanking because a lot of the excess liquidity in the world makes its way into risk assets when it doesn't have a proper home. Now, a lot of the money that was invested in UST and Luna was effectively on the balance sheets of big creditors or big institutional lenders and borrowers. When that happened, it started to affect balance sheets across the whole industry. And little by little, all of a sudden, dominoes started to fall. First, we had Celsius, and now we have Three Arrows Capital. Now, effectively, this brings into question the solvency of other people like BlockFi and other big crypto lenders across the ecosystem. Really simply, if you have your money deposited in a closed centralized organization, organization like BlockFi, like Celsius, like Nexo, like really anywhere that says, give us your money and we'll give you returns, I would get your money out of there pretty darn quickly because we really don't know where the bottom of the pool is here. And it's really important to realize that as credit leaves the system, it has a huge toll on price. So that's what's going on. Credit left the entire system when the Fed changed their policy. Now the Luna collapse and its contagion has wiped out creditors across many top level institutional borrowers and lenders in crypto. So the point here is that all of this credit leaving the system is very bad for coin prices. That's just a very simple way to think of it. Less credit equals less risk and less money in the system. He also warns here that we've had an orderly liquidation, but there's still many more people who need to delever. Price-wise, honestly, he has no idea. We probably need the big casino owners to step in. After all, if your clients die, you need to wait for more clients to come in again for your business to work out. However, if nobody steps in, we might see prices going below 10K. After all, we've seen the perfect storm set up, QE, et cetera. Now we have the perfect storm for delever across all financial assets, rate hikes, QT, inflation. Finally, if you found this thread useful, please retweet it so we have people properly aware of the big mess here and actually step in. Also, if you're wondering why BTC and ETH are the first to be sold off, it's because in a crisis, you sell what you can, not what you want. Effectively, there's no liquidity to sell most alts. That's why they don't sell the alts. They sell Bitcoin and ETH. As you can see here, we have more proof here on chain of 3AC getting wrecked. We have a Peck Shield alert. Shout out to Peck Shield, really awesome company doing audits uh, and other cool stuff on the blockchain. As you can see, you have thousands of Ethereum being liquidated um, from 3AC's known addresses. So as you can see, there's proof here that they're liquidating Ethereum in mass, probably to cover some of their margin positions. And so now let's get into the ultra cringe part of this. And this is because Suzu, someone who is so confident, so unbelievably bullish, who inspires confidence in this market and certain pockets of the market in specific, tweeted stuff like this uh, in 2021. Those who do not manage their risk will have the market manage it for them. You can't help but feel a sense of irony here. And you feel a little bit of ripples, a little bit of shades of Do Kwon here and all of his egoism about price, stability, and of course, just bullishness in the market that came home to roost. And of course, 
course, the memes are pouring in here. We see, of course, uh, Suzu up here on the cross, along with Alex Mashinsky. And I think that might be Barry Silbert over there on the third spike. Anyway, uh, you see the McDonald's uh, icon in the background. Pretty, pretty uh, austere and epic. We have someone saying yesterday that, as far as they know, Three Arrows Capital is still not communicating with their counterparties, which means they don't really have anything good to say. Now, shifting gears here, I want to talk a little bit about the egoism, about 3AC, and about surviving. As you can see, some of the biggest billionaires, some of the most prolific investors in the world have gotten completely caught off sides by this bear market. If you're still alive, you did better than Doquan, Celsius, and Three Arrows Capital wag me. Now, before we get carried away celebrating, just know that there's a real lesson here, I think. As Ninja says, the blow up of 3AC is a prime example that it isn't always about the money. Obviously, these people always had money. Sometimes it's about addiction. It's about ego. Sometimes it's about making it all back. Sometimes people just can't take a loss. In the end, you have to realize toxic emotions and know when to take a break. This is something we've talked about ad nauseum here on the channel, which is that effectively crypto is you against you. Now, if, of course, any of these founders had had the sort of wherewithal to understand how risky what they were doing was, maybe they would have delevered earlier or effectively not reached a spot where they could literally lose it all. This is called risk management. And when you're on top, sometimes it seems like it's impossible to lose. This is how bear markets happen, is the bull market goes on so long, you start to wonder if it will ever end or if it's even possible for it to end. And that's precisely where the bear gets you worse than ever. Now, the flip side is also true. When the bear market has gone on so long, you worry and you wonder if a bull market is ever possible again. And that's precisely when the bull market starts forming. Just know, this game goes in both directions. But it's crazy to see some of the heroes of the 2021 bull run go down in flames. One of my favorite accounts here, bringing some really dark humor to the space, shout out to Gainsey, said, you don't get insane wealth without taking uh, degenerate risks. Billionaires blowing up and round tripping fortunes is just a testament of how insane price action has been in both directions. Again, this is wild. This is historic. This is, in my opinion, even worse in some ways than the 2018 crash because of the level of sophistication, the level of support that the industry was pretty much a accustomed to the thickness of the books, the types of institutional players. And what you're seeing is that there's no one too smart uh, to really outsmart the market. And that greed and the failure to just sit a few plays out, to sell into stables, to effectively manage your risk and to protect what you've earned in the bull market, that's just something that you see as a very, very difficult skill. In fact, I'm still shocked at to how difficult it is. Messages from friends I have that failed to keep any of their gains from 2021, it really hurts my heart and it's going to impact heavily how I try to cover crypto going forward, knowing how many people had such important, such magnificent pieces of wealth and failed to keep hold of it. It's pretty insane to see, but it's important to realize that you're not alone if this happened to you, that some of the most brilliant people in the world did this. And I know for a fact that many of those people have made and lost fortunes many times. I know Gainsey has. He's spoken about how many times he's made and lost generational wealth. It is possible to recoup. However, you need to stay engaged. You don't need to be taking crazy risks but it is really critical that you at least stay focused on crypto if you want to be there for the return. Again, here's a list of main characters that have either still alive, still main character, have been killed off. Um, this is a funny list. Uh, you have Mark Carpellis, Brock Pierce, Charlie Shrem. These are like really OG. Mark Carpellis ran Mt. Gox Exchange. Uh, Roger Veer was the original Bitcoin Jesus. Um, we have Justin Sun apparently is still alive, though. I don't know. He's going pretty aggressively trying to stabilize his own version of Luna UST on Tron. Terrible timing by him. Uh, Brad Garlinghouse, who runs Ripple, been killed off. Dominic Williams, not actually sure who that is. Chris Larson created Ripple. Um, he's been uh, slain, sort of. Uh, Vitalik Buterin, still alive, still kicking. It makes you realize just how special it is that Vitalik is still Vitalik, still so esteemed, um, and still has maintained uh, his position in crypto when it's so easy to make a mistake and get killed off. Dan Larimer died throughout the EOS debacle. Arthur Hayes, despite everything, is still a celebrated and important character. As you can see, crypto has a habit of eating its golden geese. I would add Suzu to this. I would add Doquan to this um, as people who have been killed off. I mean, oh yeah, they still, yeah, they have more down here. Do Kwon, Suzu, uh, SBF still alive, Cheng Peng Zhao still alive, Charles Hoskinson still alive, Michael Saylor still alive. Anyway, the point is, it's very easy for these big people to absolutely lose it and to end up in the meat grinder section of crypto instead of remaining the main characters. Being a head or being a star in crypto comes with an insane amount of risk, even for these big people who have made it. And a lot of these collapses can be very easily attributed to ego. 
Shifting to some more positive news, we have Linda Ji saying here that this would be her third bear market working in crypto. It's by far the most optimistic she's ever seen working in one. Just looking around the talent and products being built, we're nowhere close to this level in the past bear markets, and it'll only keep coming out stronger as before. Pretty much the same goes. Every time the bottom is much higher than the last bottom, the amount of optimism, the amount of builders, and the amount of real tech and real code being shipped that'll improve the world keeps going up only. And it's only a matter of time between value and price start to meet at a happy equilibrium and hopefully in a sustainable way. Now, again, big shout out to CZ for this one. As you can see, he's got himself on this uh, stock photo. This is Binance we're hiring. You can't help but love the, the humor here. He says, it was not easy saying no to Super Bowl ads, stadium naming rights, large sponsor deals a few months ago, but we did. Today, we are hiring 2,000 open positions for Binance. So shout out for them for going turbo during the bear, something I can totally respect. Again, my projects are extremely well-funded, have been extremely cautious about spending through the bull, and uh, some really cool announcements coming out very soon about that. Uh, but the reality is, is that I definitely respect founders who play it cautiously during the bull market, who aggressively sell things for stables, and who prepare for the potential winters that could occur, those companies that survive and are able to keep up momentum through the bear end up being absolute kings and leaders during the next bull. And that is what founders should always do. So you gotta love CZ for playing it close to the chest during the bull market. And on the 14th, we see Cumberland saying, after a period of relative calm, we are now seeing the largest flows through the year through our OTC desk. This is a bit unexpected and likely a signal that we are either nearing a local bottom or at the bottom. Anyway, the point is that while I still think we need the Fed to make some kind of pivot before crypto can regain its momentum or at least stabilize, the reality is, is that we're seeing some signs that big institutional investors are starting to buy in en masse. That is always a good sign. So what we know is that we're experiencing the largest destruction of wealth in modern history. This is not just unique to crypto. This is a blanket across all risk assets. And in my opinion, we need for this moment to play out before we can start making meaningful recovery in crypto. But that said, the projects that actually understood the market, that were veterans, that made sure to have years of runway siphoned off, the projects that will keep building and shipping relentlessly regardless of market conditions, those projects are the ones to keep an eye on. And unfortunately, they're less common than you would imagine. Even after the 2018 ICO destruction, where almost every project held their entire treasuries in Ethereum, well, you thought projects would have been wiser this time. So hopefully we'll see a slew of projects with awesome tech that have planned for the winter. I know I've ensured as much as true for my own projects, but as the boomers would say, when the tide goes out, we see who is swimming naked. The reality is, is that we don't know who's prepared for these tough times and who's not. But I'm excited to keep building, to see crypto eventually form a bottom, to invest at the lows and throughout the bear market, and to remain both optimistic and focused on the long-term vision that blockchain technology will dramatically improve our everyday lives on the internet, which is only becoming a more and more important part of our daily lives. If you guys enjoyed this content, smash that like button. Remember to subscribe because we're going to be bringing you critical updates that can help you avoid the pain of the bear. There are opportunities throughout this market and there is always a way to be positioning and we're going to be doing our best to bring all of that information to you. As always, I thank you so much for watching. My name is Elio Trades and I'll see you very soon on the next episode.